Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, I kind of promised that I would read a bit of this book, so I'm going to do that. Um, yes, I don't ever do things like this, so it's a little bit weird, but we're going to get into it. Yeah, it's a little bit weird, but we're going to get into it. Okay, so... This is Violet Bent Backwards Over the Grass by Lana Del Rey. Dedicated to whomever's warm, warm afternoon hands come upon these pages. Wherever you may find them, and that you may remember that the world is conspiring for you and to act in a manner as such. The first poem is... Violet bent backwards over the grass. I went to the party, I came in hot, made decisions beforehand, my mind made up. Things that would make me happy, to do them or not. Each option weighed quietly, a plan for each thought. But then I walked through the door, past the open concept, and saw Violet bent backwards over the grass. Seven years old, with dandelions grasped, tightly in her hands arched like a bridge in a fallen handstand, grinning wildly like a madman, with the exuberance that only doing nothing can bring, waiting for the fireworks to begin. And in that moment, I decided to, to do nothing about everything. Forever. It's a nice picture, don't you think? I mean, it's just grass. Okay. The next poem is Bare Feet on Linoleum. Stay on your path, Sylvia Plath. Don't fall away like all the others. Don't take all your secrets alone to your watery grave about lovers and mother. The secrets you keep will keep you in a deep like father and Amy and brother. And all of the people you meet on the street will reiterate lies that she uttered. Leave me in peace, I cry. Late at night on a slow boat found for Cal Catalina for no reason. Scratch that. Leave me in peace, I cry. Late at night on a slow boat bound for Catalina for no reason. Tiny beads of sweat dot my forehead could be mistaken for dewdrops if this were photo season. But alas, this is real life and it's been a real fight just to keep my mind from committing treason. Why, you ask? Because she told the townspeople I was crazy and the lies they started to believe them. But anyway, I moved on now. And now that I've gone scorched earth, I'm left wondering where to go from here. To Sonoma, where the fires have just left. South Dakota? Would standing in front of Mount Rushmore feel like the great American homecoming I never had? Would the magnitude of the scales of the sculpture take the place of the warm embrace I've never known? Or should I just be here now, in the kitchen, bare feet on linoleum, bored, but not unhappy, cutting vegetables over boiling water that I will later turn into stew? Here's the picture for that one. I could probably take a pick of my stove like that. I, I think that that poem was in the actual book though. I mean the actual audio book. I know the first one was. This next poem is called What Happened When I Left You. Perfect petals punctuate the fabric's yellow blue. Silver platters with strawberries strewn across the room. In Zimmerman with sandals on one summer dress to choose. Three girls, eyes rolled, loud laughter, dust specks lit by afternoon. My life is sweet like the lemonade, now there's no bitter fruit. Eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, no thought of you. My thoughts have changed, my voice is higher, now I'm over you. No flickering in my head, movies projected in Bellevue because I captured the mood of my wish fulfilled and sailed to Xanadu. 
The grief that came in waves that rolled I navigated through. The fire from my wish as wind to a future trip to Malibu. Now everything I have is perfect, nothing much to do. Just perfect florals, green embroidered chairs, one dress to choose. Damn, Lana. Here's the photo for that, for that poem. But I'll just let you in. Oof, this is a good poem to read, so hold on, everybody. Sorry. So here is the poem, L.A. Who Am I to Love You, from Lana Del Rey, and Violet Bent Backwards Over the Grass. Sorry, Waffles is playing. L.A., I'm from nowhere, who am I to love you? L.A., I've got nothing, who am I to love you? When I'm feeling this way, and I've got nothing to offer. L.A., not quite the city that never sleeps, not quite the city that wakes, but the city that dreams for sure. If by dreams, you mean nightmares. L.A., I'm a dreamer, but I'm from nowhere, who am I to dream? L.A., I'm upset, I have complaints, listen to me. They say I come for money, and I didn't, and I didn't even have love, and it's unfair. L.A., I sold my life rights for a big check, but now I can't sleep at night, and I don't know why. Plus, I love sex, so why did I do that when I know it won't last? L.A., I picked San Francisco because the man who doesn't love me lives there. L.A., I'm pathetic, but so are you. Can I come home now? Daughter to no one, table for one, party of thousands of people, I don't know, at Delilah, where my ex-husband works. I'm so sick of this, but can I come home now? Mother to no one, private jet for one, black home to the Tudor house that born a thousand murder plots. Hancock Park treated me very badly. I'm resentful. The witch on the corner, the neighbor nobody wanted, the reason for Garcetti's extra security. LA, I know I'm bad, but I have nowhere to go. Can I come home now? I never had a mother. Will you let me make the sun my own now, and the ocean my sun? I'm quite good at tending to things despite my upbringing. Can I raise your mountains? I promise to keep them greener, make them my daughters, teach them about fires, warn them about water. I'm lonely, LA. Can I come home now? I left my city for San Francisco. I'm riding from the Golden Gate Bridge, but it's not going as planned. I took a free ride off a billionaire and brought my typewriter and promised myself I would stay, but it's just not going the way I thought. It's not that I feel different. I don't mind that it's not hot. It's just that I belong to no one, which means there's only one place for me. The city not quite awake. The city not quite asleep. The city that's something else, something in between. The city that's still deciding how good it should be. And also, I can't sleep without you. No one's ever really held me like you. Not quite tightly, but certainly I feel your body next to me, smoking next to me, vaping lightly next to me. And I love that you love the neon lights like me, orange in the distance. We both love that, and I love that we have that in common. Also, neither of us can go back to New York, for you are unmoving. As for me, it won't be my city again until I'm dead. Fuck the New York Post. L.A., who am I to need you when I need so much, ask for so much, what I've been given? I'm not sh yet sure I may never know that either until I'm dead. For now, though, what I do know is that I don't deserve you, not you at your best, in your splendor with towering eucalyptus trees that sway in my dominion, not you at your worst, totally on fire, unlivable, unbreathable. I don't deserve you at all. You see, you have a mother. A continental shelf, a larger piece of land from where you came. And I am an orphan, a little sh seashell that rests upon your native shores. One of many, that's for sure, because of that, I surely must love you closely to the most out of anyone. For that reason, let me love you. Don't mind my desperation. Let me hold you, not just for vacation, but for real and for forever. Make it real life. Let me be a real wife to you. Girlfriend, lover, mother, friend, I adore you. Don't be put off by my quick-wordedness. I'm generally quite quiet, 
quiet a meditator, actually. I'll do very well down by Paramahansa Yoganda's Realization Center, I'm sure. I promise, you'll barely even notice me until you want to notice me, unless you prefer a rambunctious child, in which case I can turn it on too. I'm good on the stage, as you may know. You may have heard of me. So either way, I'll fit in just fine. So love me by doing nothing, except for perhaps by not shaking the county line. I'm yours if you'll have me, quietly or loudly. Sincerely, your daughter. Regardless, you're mine. Wow. Here's a, here's a photo. I wonder if there's like, where she was writing everything. Like, I wonder why she took these pictures and why she wanted these photos, like, to go along with this book specifically. You know, it's crazy. No, oh, he's so cute, he's playing. Okay, so I think the next few... No, okay. I measure my... I measure time by the days I've spent away from you. Thought that occurred to me as I watched the sky go dark from blue. That's cute. In the television. So this poem is called The Land of a Thousand Fires. Two blue steel trains run through the tunnels of your cool blue steel eyes. Vernon. Rock Quarry. The vastness of which has nothing on my beautiful mind, Dylan. I hear Dylan when I look at you. I can see it on my arm in invisible ink like a tattoo. The yin to my yank. The toughness to my unending softness. A striking example of masculinity. Firm in your verticality. verticality. Sure in your confrontation against all elements and duality. The sun to my wilting daisy. The earth to my wildflower that doesn't care where it grows. Vernon. Everything's burnt here. There's no escaping it. The air is fried and on fire. I've never really fallen in love, but whatever this feeling is, I wish everyone could experience it. This place feels like a person. Familiar. Like someone I've stood next to before, but never while I stand next to you. Thank you. For being here. For, being, for bearing witness to my vastness. Through the years I've called you in and out of my orbit. You, in your madness. The satellite that's constellating my world, mimicking the inner chaos that I've disowned. A mirror to my past life retribution, a reflection of my sadness. If I'm going to keep on living the way that I'm living, I can't do it without you. My feet aren't on the ground. I need your body to stand on, your name to define me. On top of being a woman, I am scared and ethereal and... There are seven worlds in my eyes. I'm accessing all of them at once. One to draw my words from and my muses. Another one I try and harness late at night that lies around somewhere off the right of Jupiter. And then, of course, there's this one I live in. The land of a thousand fires. That's where you come in. You, Vernon, Dylan. Two blue steel trains. Running through the tunnels of your cool blue steel eyes. To guide me far from the world of my early days that I can't quite make out clearly that beckoned me toward high sea cliffs on long car rides, toward a future place, a world unknown to me, made up of something surreal and dripping flowers and solar systems oversized. You, Vernon, Dylan. No words needed to sponge up the dark nights, no explanation for the globes in my eyes, shoulder to shoulder in the factory light, letting me be who I would have been if everything had turned out all right. Three alternative endings course through my blood on ice. I thrive because I say I do and because it's what I write. But honestly, if you weren't here, I don't know what things would look like. That's why, no matter what world I'm in, I navigate by satellite. Vernon. Dylan. And you and your madness. Two trains running through your cool blue eyes. Dang. Here's another picture. Miss Poetry. Oh, nice. 
So Vernon, I wonder if Vernon is just a place. Hmm. Okay, I think I'm only gonna read a few more um, from this book. Probably gonna split it up a little bit into maybe three readings. Um, so, you guys have that, okay? Um, but I'm gonna keep reading a little bit more of this book. May my eyes always stay level to the horizon. May they never gaze as high as heaven to ask why. May I never go where angels fear to tread so as to have to ask for answers in the sky. That's why in this lifetime I found art inconsequential compared to the magic of the nowness, the solution to most questions. There are no reasons. And if there are, I'm wrong. But at least I won't have spent my life waiting looking for God in the clouds of the dawn or listening out for otherworldly contact. 30 billion light years on. No, I'll let the others do the pondering while I'll be sitting on the lawn, reading something unsubstantial with the television on. I'll be up early to rise through, of course, but only to make you a pot of coffee. That's why I was thinking this morning, Joe, that it's times like this as the marine layer lifts off the sea from the view of our favorite restaurant that I pray that I may always keep my eyes level to your eye line, never downcast at the tablecloth. Yes, Joe. It's fine. Okay, I'm just gonna pick up at Tessa Di Petro. No one ever touched me without wanting to kill me, except for a healer on 6th Street in Ridgely. Tessa Di Pietro. Recommended casually by a medium I no longer know. She said my number one problem was my field was untrusting. When asked what to do, she paused and said, nothing. Which sent me into uncontrollable sobbing. Because there's never anything you can do about the important things. She said, okay, one thing you can do is picture the floor rising up to support you and sink into the back of the bed that's behind you. Too much of your energy is in front of and above you, which for some reason made me think of a live show I had seen. Jim Morrison at the Hollywood Bowl, 1968. Check date. The blue trellised lights gave him an unusual aura, like a halo something made him eight feet or taller. I remember just thinking he looked out of his body, but definitely like a god on stage. So I told him, Maybe an artist has to function a little bit above themselves, if they really want to transmit some heaven. Then she told me, seeing as a focus is the key to transmission, for an emphasis on developing inner intuition. Close your eyes and feel where you hold your attention. If it's in the back of, your eyes will walk it down to your heart center, and make that the new place from which your thoughts enter. Clairvoyance comes from that, mostly from this simple function. Oh. And Jim died at 27, so find another frame of reference when you're referencing heaven. And did you ever read the lyrics to People Are Strange? He made no sense. Here's the pick. Okay. So past the bushes, Cypress Thriving. This is actually one of my faves from the book. I saw you in the mirror. You were wearing your hair differently, carrying the air differently. You say you want your hair long, parted in the middle, long in solidarity, worn for all his women. Long Beach, aimless. Your fingers wiping oil on the paper with precision, with decision, like an artist never seen, yet with a vision, with a reason, stared with venom at the ceiling, but not the grass, but straight ahead, just at the skyline with precision, laser vision. Time was stopping, moving through you, you dictated by what moved you, only moving, never thinking, match the sun that's slowly sinking, at the height of afternoon, in the heat of summer evening, like a phoenix, like a chemtrail, like a wavelength no one's claiming. Georgia O'Keeffe, Georgia Peaches, doing nothing but your painting. For forever, forget teachers, forgive him forever leaving. Love is rising, no resisting. Cheeks are flushing, now you're living. Say goodbye, now no resisting. Live your life like no one's listening. Be the art that life is breathing. Be the soul the world is living. 
do what you want for you only, not for giving, just for taking. No one's listening. At the end of Lime and 10th Street, down the road that's green and winding, past the bushes, cypress thriving, past the chain link fence and driving, farther down the road less traveled, there you are, athleisure wear unraveled, now I see you clear. Standing stoic, blue in denim, eyes not blue, but clear like heaven. You don't want to be forgotten. You just want to disappear. Wow. I really loved reading that. Oh. That's such a good poem. Look how pretty. I feel like that, yeah, I definitely feel like this is where she lives. This is definitely a, a vibe. I think that's where I'm going to stop today because one of my other favorite poems is the next one. And yeah, I'm definitely going to stop there. And I may do like two more readings after this of the book. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Hello everybody, welcome back. So if you are here watching this again, it's because I am continuing to read Lana's book, her poetry book, Violet and Bent Backwards Over the Grass. And I intentionally left off last place because it's actually one of my favorite poems. So, I'm going to read that now, though. We left off at Never to Heaven. I actually went through these. Oh, we did, no, 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 we did, just, we did that one, too. Yes, welcome back to the second poetry reading. All right, so this is one of my favorite poems she has written in this book, but it is a little bit lengthy, so bear with me. She's gonna be playing in the background. Don't, do not mind her. Okay. I took a flying lesson on my 33rd birthday instead of calling you we're parking on the block where our old place used to be. Genesee, Genesee, Genesee. Pathetic, I know, but sometimes I still like to park on that street and have lunch in the car just to feel close to you. I was once in love with my life here, in that studio apartment with you. Little yellow flowers on the tops of trees as our only view, out of the only window big enough for me to see our future through. But it turned out I was the only one who could see it. Stupid apartment complex. Terrible you. You who I wait for. You, you, you. Like a broken record stuck on loop. So that day, on my birthday, I thought something has to change. It can't always be about waiting for you. Don't tell anyone, but part of my reasoning for taking the flight class was this idea that if I could become my own navigator, a captain of the sky, that perhaps I could stop looking for direction from you. Well, what started off as an idea on a whim has turned into something more. Too shy to explain to the owners that my first lesson was just a one-time thing. I've continued to go to classes each week at the precious little strip off of Santa Monica and Bundy. And everything was going fine. We were starting with dips and loops, and then something terrible happened. During my fourth lesson in the sky, my instructor, younger than I, but as tough as you, instructed me to do a simple maneuver. It's not that I didn't do it, but I was slow to lean the sport cruiser into a right hand upward turn. Scared. Scared that I would lose control of the plane. Not tactfully and not gently, the instructor shook his head and without looking at me said, you don't trust yourself. I was horrified, feeling as though I had somehow been found out, like he knew me, how weak I was. Of course, he was only talking about my ability as a pilot. For me, they held a deeper meaning. I didn't trust myself, not just 2,500 feet above the coast of Malibu, but with anything, and I didn't trust you. I could have said something, but I was quiet, 
Because pilots aren't like poets. They don't make metaphors between life and the sky. In the midst of this midlife meltdown navigational exercise in self-examination, I also decided to do something else I always wanted to do. Take sailing lessons in the vibrant bay of Marina del Rey. I signed up for the classes of Elizabeth Grant and nobody blinked an eye. So why was I so sure that when I walked into the tiny shack on Bali Way, someone would say, you're not a captain of a ship or the master of the sky. No. The fishermen didn't care, and so neither did I. And for a brief moment, I felt more myself than ever before, letting the self-proclaimed drunkard captain's lesson wash over me like the foamy tops of the sea. Midway through, my forehead burned and my hands raw from driving, the captain told me the most important thing I would need to know on the sea. Never run the ship into irons. That's nautical terms for not sailing the boat directly into the wind. In order to do that, though, you have to know where the wind is coming from, and you might not have time to look to the mast or up farther to the weather vane, so you have to feel where the wind is coming from, on your cheeks, and by the tips of the white waves, from which direction they're rolling. To do this, he gave me an exercise. He told me to close my eyes and ask me to feel on my neck which way the wind was blowing. I already knew I was going to get it wrong. The wind is coming from everywhere. I feel it all over, I told him. No, he said. The wind is coming from the left, the port side. I sat waiting for him to tell me, you don't trust yourself. But he didn't, so I said it for him. I don't trust myself. He laughed, gentler than the pilot, but still not realizing that my failure in the exercise was hitting me at a much deeper level. It's not that you don't trust yourself, he said. It's simply that you're not a captain. It isn't what you do. Then he told me he wanted me to practice every day so I would get better. Which grocery store do you go to, he asked. To the Ralphs and the Palisades, I replied. Okay, when you're in the Ralphs and the Palisades, I want you to, as you're walking from your car to the store, to close your eyes and feel which way the wind is blowing. Now, I don't want you to look like a crazy person crouching in the middle of the parking lot, but everywhere you go, I want you to try and find which way the wind is coming from, and then determine if it's from the port or the starboard side. So when you're back on the boat, you'll have a better sense of it. I thought his advice was adorable. I could already picture myself in the parking lot squinting my eyes with perfect housewives looking on. I could picture myself growing a better sense of which way the wind was blowing and as I did, a tiny bit of deeper trust also began to grow within myself. I thought of mentioning it, but I didn't because captains aren't like poets. They don't make metaphors between the sea and sky. And as I thought that to myself, I realized that's why I write. All of this circumnavigating the earth was to get back to my life. Six trips to the moon for my poetry to arise. I'm not a captain. I'm not a pilot. I write. I write. And then it's a blank friggin' page. Whatever. It's crazy. It's such a gorgeous poem. Such a gorgeous poem. Okay. If I fuck this up, it's because the book is is styled in this very strange way. This stuff is bomb. The next poem is called Quiet Waiter Blue Forever. You move like water, sweet baby, sweet waiter, making the night smile to no one you cater. Quiet woodworker from midnight till later, my lover, my laughter, my armor, my maker. The way that I feel with you is something like aching. Inside my stomach, the cosmos are baking. A universe hung like a mobile, the alignment of these planets unique. In me, the earth moves around the sun. No land, all sea. Water world, sun chaser, tropic of cancer, southern equator. I'm the crying crustacean, sunbathing on paper, moon. Let's rewrite the beginning of the primordial ooze, shall we, my love? And my being brazen for saying this here makes me feel like we could have wrote it better than him. But who am I? Just a girl in love, scribbling in journals, rearranging the salt and the pepper. In love with you, my blue, quiet waiter, forever, summer, quiet waiter, weather, blue forever. Call me when you're done with work, the darker the better. 
I'll pick you up later. She put, ha, 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 ha. Call me when you're done with work. The later, the better. If you didn't want me to read that twice, I'm so sorry. I wanted to read it twice. That's what happened. My bedroom is a sacred place now. There are children at the foot of my bed. Uh, Miss Elizabeth loves uh, long titles. Last year when I wrote you my last letter, the beginning of my future poetry, I acknowledged you were for the first time. I didn't call you by any other name. I let you know that I knew the true nature of your heart, that it was evil, that it convinced me that darkness is real, that the devil is a real devil, and that monsters don't always know they are monsters. But projection is an interesting thing. After you burned the house down, you tried to convince me that I was the one holding the matches. You told me that I didn't know what I had done. You said, I don't know who I am, but I do know who I am. I love rose gardens. I buy violets every time someone leaves me. <clears throat> I love the great sequoias of Yosemite. And if you ask my sister to describe the first thing she thinks of when she thinks of me, she would say, wood smoke. I'm gentle, I'm funny when I'm drunk. Though I haven't been drunk for 14 years, I go on trips to the beach with my friends who don't know that I'm crazy. I can do that. I can do anything, even leave you. Because my bedroom is a sacred place now. There are children at the foot of my bed, telling me stories about the friends they pretend to hate that they will make up with tomorrow. And there are fresh cut flowers that I grew myself in vases on nightstands, hand carved by old pals from Big Sur. And the longer I stay here, the more I am sure that the more I step into becoming a poet, the less I will fall into being with you. The more I step into my poetry, the less I will fall into being with you. The more I step into poetry, the less I will fall into being with you. The more I step into my poetry, the less I will fall into being with you. The more I step into becoming a poet, the less I will fall into bed with you. She's crazy. Oh my God, she looks so cute. So, so, so cute. Okay. In the hills of Benedict Canyon. Love has room to grow in the hills of Benedict Canyon. My green typewriter light is on. And two months lined between me, <clears throat> and two months time between me and my last man. No double murder plots looming over neighbors' vacant lots that I look upon at twilight still light enough for the Starline bus to ca be carrying on. I listen to the hippie spouting nonsense at the foot of Bella Drive, hammering on about Sharon and the sanctity of life. I listen on intently, thanks for the free ride, and reminding me that everything comes down to a story and to laugh when you could cry. But finally, I have no reason for tears. Not tonight at 727. First time in months I feel close to heaven, in the hills of Benedict Canyon. The background hum of the television. Love has room to grow. No more secrets, no more reasons to put off what I already know. No more big projects. No new dev breaking ground on sunset. No big builds blasting too long up on Mullahend. No joint ventures fracturing. No unchained melodies enchanting the bars in my head. No, just news. Nothing going on at 727. Not quite ready for dinner. Just the background hum of television. Me, standing out on the deck, wondering what phase of twilight the sky is in, and contemplating how the Dodgers are doing and reaching for the phone to call an old friend. I don't think this poem was in the audiobook. This one says, you're only as happy as your least happy child. You're only as happy as your least happy child. Damn. This one is called Happy, and I actually love this poem too. It goes along with a nice photo. You thought I was rich and I am, but not how you think. I live in a Tudor house under the freeway in Mar Vista by the beach. When you call, I take my phone outside to the picnic table that I brought from the Rose Bowl. And I listen to the rushing cars above and think about the last time you visited me. The last time we made love. How the noise got louder and louder during rush hour until it sounded like the sea. 
and I felt like the ocean was the sky, and that I was flying because you were two feet taller than me, until you took me in your arms, and I could touch the stars, and they all fell down around my head, and I became an angel, and you put me to bed. Happy. People think that I'm rich, and I am, but not how they think. I have a truck with a gold keychain in the ignition, and on the back it says, happy, joyous, and free. Happy. And when I drive, I think about the last time my friends were driving with me, how the radio was so loud that we couldn't hear the words, so we became the music. Happy. They write that I rich and I am, but not how they think. I have a safe I call the boyfriend box, and in it every saved receipt, every movie theater ticket, just to remind me of all the things I've loved and lost and loved again unconditionally. You joke that I'm rich and I am, but not how you think. I live in a Tudor house under the freeway off of Rose Avenue, 12 blocks from the beach. And when you call, I put your sweater on and put you on speaker and chat for hours underneath the trees and think about the last time you were here lying next to me, how the noise from the cars got louder and louder during rush hour until it sounded like a river or a stream. And it felt like we were swimming, but it wasn't just a dream. We were just happy. Man. Again, I'm not gonna show all these pictures because I don't want to show the entire book. Sugarfish. Let me stick to something sweet. Sugar on my hands and feet. Sugarfish San Vicente. Sugar, sugar in my teeth. From your kiss, you texting me. From the movie theater seat. Dodger Stadium Slurpee. White confection in the sea. Powder waves froth over me. A fortune teller once told me, do the things that you are sweet and a sweet man is sure to follow. So I made a bath that night of honey, dipped my toes in rose and money, stayed all night in that bath water, even some I swallowed. Now there's so much sugar on me, I can't keep the bees off me. Even most of my thoughts are charming. Some are blue and borrowed. Sugar, sugar, lips and teeth. Fingertips touch emojis. Hard forever, hearts on fleek. BB, please come over. What does she think she is? That was so cute. I actually feel like I want to do a photo shoot to that or something. Ringtone. I put my third phone on in the waistband of my leggings. Only you have this number. Six plus vibrates with your own ringtone. I smile when I hear simulated children laughing because I know it's you. It's the little things that make me smile. I keep them just for myself. I like you so much, but it makes me nervous when you don't call. Under my breath, I say, don't make me be resilient. I so want to be soft. If you let me be myself, you will be the first one who ever did. Oh my goodness, girl. Okay, I'm actually going to stop there. Um, again, I wanted this to be in three parts. And the rest are really just high. There's like two or three more poems and the rest are haikus. And because that's going to be like a really fast thing, um, I think that would be a really good uh, stopping point for us today. So thank you guys for watching this one again and as part two for Violet uh, reading. And I'll see you next time. I'm gonna be finished reading Violet today. Uh, we don't actually have many pages left and the rest of them are pretty short, except the first few. So we're just gonna get into it. This is called the ringtone. I put my third phone in the waistband of my leggings. Only you have this number. Six plus vibrates with your own ringtone. I smile when I hear simulated children laughing because I know it's you. It's the little things that make me smile. I keep them just for myself. I like you so much, but it makes me nervous when you don't call. Under my breath I say, don't make me be resilient. I still want you to be soft. If you let me be myself, you'll be the first one who ever did. And that's paired with this photo of a phone and I also like that ending lyric I mean the ending 
line because it is a lyric of hers. So it's a it's nice little Easter egg. In the flats of Melrose. What will it take for me not to feel like the train will run away with me bound up like the sad heroine tied to the last car? What will it take for me not to need you so I can just have you for fun and for who you really are? Not you as the savior, not me as Ophelia, not us putting our faith in the public's dark art. Topanga on Sunday, two cats in the yard, NPR rumbling quietly, a fire in the hearth, me with a knowingness deep in my heart that nothing could stop me, no valley too far, to walk through in darkness to keep us apart. And that we don't need fighting to find resolution, that not every marriage ends in dissolution. That I don't need you, but I want you because you're so cool, and I'm not that damaged, and you're not hell bent on being some indie director or whatever pipe dream you and your friends are smoking, that it's enough just for us to be sitting in the flats of Melrose my heart on fire, a tall boy cracked open. I love you, Josiah. I'm sorry I'm still broken, but I could still make you happy. Let's pour one out to knowing, not hoping. That's a really good fucking poem. I actually really like that. It was, these poems that I'm reading were not on the audiobook, but I'm really happy that this was saved for this moment. <clears throat> Thanks to the locals. So the next poem, it's a little bit long. I ran from you to Lake Arrowhead. I didn't tell you where I was going. I knew I had a 24-hour grace period before you were done making your film. I went to an AA meeting, and my share read like a tale of battered housewife. I felt everyone's eyes on me. The rehab kids in the back row stopped throwing spitballs at each other and stared at me. I fucking hate my life. I waited after the meeting in the parking lot for any of the local ladies to come up on me. Only one did. Kira. I don't really have much advice for you, she said. I was in over my head, out of my league, in the wrong place, wrong season, wrong time, wrong face, and I knew it, but I didn't know what to do. You asked me to marry you. You said your mother was dying and you couldn't fathom your life without a woman in it. I was tempted, but it didn't seem like a good enough offer. I wanted more than that, even though I've never had anything. Not one person to call if I changed my dollar in for quarters to ask what they thought about it. But there's always been just a little tiny piece of me inside the size of a small slice of angel cake that I knew somewhere, somehow, that I deserved better than someone like you. So I got back into my truck in the dark, my little yellow pamphlet with the two numbers on it I would never call crumpled up. Kara, with her local area code and gratefully also her sponsor, Gail from Pal Palmdale. I didn't feel better and I didn't use the numbers, but I thought that I had been very brave that I did the best I could, sharing in a big room, tears streaming down my face in my high school flannel, just to say, the man that I love hates me, but it would be easier to stay. As the last person's lights flooded over my windshield, that night became very quiet, and I thought, if I go back and I end it, how would I handle driving down your street and it becoming a distant memory? Not reality, no longer sweet. Sweet the way it tastes in my mouth to say your name. Sweet like when I was young driving down those roads before we're done. Before any big battles were lost or won. Unbeknownst to everyone, except for you and me. As sweet as a junkie's limited concept of love can be, I thought, because you were clean, you were a lot like me. Wanting to be closer to something big and free. But some people need their secrets. And now my greatest battle will be this unchained melody in my heart from not having you next to me to shut the door on the past and step blindly into the abyss, no destination intact, the only direction set in the compass, to move forward. So I drove, back and forth, on the rim of the world's highway, and the beauty of its name reminded me that I was beautiful, that some things are beautiful for no reason. Not everyone needs to pretend to love their girlfriend just because their mother is dying, or because they're afraid of change in season. Anyway. I don't have a pretty couplet to give resolution to this poem, nothing very eloquent to say, except that I was brave and it would be easier, and it would have been easier to say. I'm so sad. Poetry is very, like, raw, and sometimes meant to be private, but they are like a release of emotions, and 
I don't think that she's saying she was an alcoholic, but she definitely went to a meeting to talk about something to feel some kind of help in this kind of situation relationship that she had. And it's sad that this is like seemingly an experience she went through. So there's that. This one is I'm writing my future. It's just the thing. These are all the haikus, I think. The universe exists because we are aware of it. Well, here's a new one. Paradise is very fragile. <clears throat> Paradise is very fragile and it seems like it's only getting worse. Down here in Florida, we are fighting toxic red tides, massive fish kills, not to mention hurricanes and rising sea levels. Back in Los Angeles, things aren't looking much better. My treehouse that had been standing for 60 years succumbed to the Woolsey fires. Who would have thought this year, at 33, you would be taken out from under me? After all those years, built from the ground up by hand by your very first owner, quiet World War I aviation pilot, I tried to save you. But the horses and German shepherds were more important. Paradise is very fragile and it seems that it's only getting worse. Our leader is a megalomaniac and we've seen that before, but never because it was what the country deserved. My friends tell me to stop calling 911 on the culture, but it's either that or I 5150 myself. They don't understand. I'm a dreamer, and I had big dreams for the country. Not for what it could do, but for how it could feel. How it could think, how it could dream. I know I know who I am. Who am I to dream for you? It's just that in my own mind, I was born with a little bit of paradise. I was lucky in that way. Not like my husband, who was born and raised in hell. I always had something gentle to give. All of me, in fact. It's one of the beautiful things about me. It's one of the beautiful things about nature. But lately, I've been thinking that I wish someone had to hold me when I was younger more about the inhabitants that thrive off of paradise. That should they take too much, there will be nothing left to give. Not everyone's nature is good or golden. And you can't fight what's in your nature. That's all I keep thinking as we're fighting the fires in Agra. That I'm tired of fighting you. Tired of you taking from me. Paradise is very fragile and it's only getting worse. And every time you leave, I seem to think about the cures bestowed upon Eve. That faithful Eve, she took that bite from that fruitful tree. You breathe me in, Kundalani, on this summer night. You in front of me, and you take, and you take, and you take, and you take. But you taste like the beach in a kiss candy for my watery eyes. In my veins that roll, you run citrus. Watercolor images of serpents on orange trees quietly arise and grow sweet in my midst. And I keep thinking that I could do this forever, just like this, but my heart is very fragile and I have nothing left to give. Damn. <sighs> Miss girl. I feel like this is definitely some of her most personal work that we don't really get too much out of from her lyrics and we think we know it all and we really don't and this is only half the story. Salamander. <clears throat> get out of my blood, Salamander. I can't seem to blow enough steam to get you out of my head. Soul cycle you to death. Run you out of my blood to San Pedro. And yet everywhere I go, it seems there you are. And there I am. I don't want to sell my stories anymore. Stop pushing me. I want to leave them underneath the nightstand to be forgotten and remembered. Should my thoughts come upon them in the middle of the night after a beach day, or by you some afternoon, to thumb through with your own warm after work hands. I love you, but you don't understand me, you see. I'm a real poet. My life is my poetry. My love making is my legacy. My thoughts are not for sale. They're about nothing and beautiful and for free. I wish you could get that and love that about me because things that can't be bought can't be evaluated and that makes them beyond human reach. Untouchable, safe, otherworldly, unable to be deciphered or metabolized, something metaphysical. Like a view of the sea on a summer day on the most perfect winding road taken in from your car seat window. A thing perfect and ready to become a part of the texture of the fabric of something more ethereal, like Mount Olympus, where Zeus and Athena and the rest of the Immortals play. 
I love you, but you don't understand me. You see, I'm a real poet. My life is my poetry. My love making is my legacy. I feel you, girl. So we're gonna read the haikus now because none of them saved. But this is a really nice, like, intro photo to the haiku section. And I feel like it also tells us, yeah, like everything's gonna be black and white. Jasmine in the air, the burden of fame is real. Never felt so clear. You in the soft light, the 405 from Venice, a river of red. Wondering if it's astronomical twilight or civil twilight. I like these trees. That's crazy that they get that tall. I wonder if they ever stop. Every night I die when I give myself to you. Sad but beautiful. Poets like comics are inherently quiet, sad, better off alone. I stepped on a bird, cried in my new boyfriend's arms. To live is to kill. For years I begged you to just take me in your arms. You wouldn't, couldn't. Babe, let's go to town, buy something sweet. Pink grapefruit, eat it with sugar. No big decisions to the lake or to the sea. My only question. I like this picture. With the cross on the electric thingy. Open the front door, hello I say to no one. I know no one's home. And there's that picture. I feel like it's interesting to end the book with like poems with no titles. Oh no, this is how the book ends. Okay. Notes for a poet. I think this is so cute. So all of these pages are notebook pages with next to oil paintings. I think, well that one, the orange one. And these strawberries. <clears throat> Those are my are definitely my favorite. There's a few pages, so I'll definitely write in them. Lunda Ray is an American singer, songwriter, artist, and poet. Violet bent backwards over the grass is her first book. Find on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and at Lana Ray. Simon and Schuster.com. That's who did her books. nice well thank you guys for sitting and listening to me read this entire book um i hope that it was fine that i split it up into three sections i just feel like it's a bit difficult to read an entire book in one sitting um i could definitely do it but not saying doing it out loud so i really liked this poem Book, and I cannot wait for the next one. I definitely think that there are some personal things in here that, you know, one um, doesn't necessarily sing about, so I think we have to genuinely be a little bit respectful of that. But overall, I'm really happy for it. Um, it's a bit intense, so I'll be sitting on it thinking about it, but I really loved it. I cannot wait for the next book. And also, apparently we're getting two albums now within the next few months, so that's really exciting, even though it's going to be an album of uh, covers. That's not the point, though. But yeah, so thank you guys for watching me read this. I uh, will hopefully see you next reading when the next book comes out. And if you guys watch any of my other videos as far as music reactions, Make sure to watch those too or check them out. But yeah, thank you guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye.